session, no code shall you use, malware shall you get. In our session today, we will talk about the implications and the impact of no code, low code application and practices to enterprise security. And of course, we'll have fun exploiting vulnerabilities in no code, low code platforms. So without further ado, let's start. Uh, it all starts with the people who are behind this research. First and foremost, Uria Elkayam from our research lab and six other students from the Technion uh, Israel Institute of Technology from the Computer Science Department who helped immensely with this research. My name is Amika Schulman. I've been doing cybersecurity for the past 30 years and actually I've been doing application security for more than 20 years now since I started in Perva in 2002. So we are going to talk about application security and we're going to talk about the local no code application era. Now, you probably know some of the names that you see here, Microsoft Power Apps or OutSystems or Mendix or UiPath, all these big names are all low code, no code platforms. And what low code, no code platforms and practices together with RPAs, the, the robotic process automations are all about is enabling the organizations to create more business applications, more automated business processes in a distributed way across the organization by people who are not necessarily software engineer and they allow them to do that without writing actual code and it could be core business processes or customer facing applications but it could also be a lot of small point solutions internal applications like the t-shirt choosing application by the HR or company event application by the, by the administration team. Now, in the local no-code world, what we have is a platform that encompasses the entire life cycle of the application from design to creation to testing to deployment into production. It all happens within that same platform, within the same environment, where the actual deployment to production happens in containers in the cloud. Sometimes they are called robots for the RPAs. And, and this whole practice, this whole system is designed to help organizations accelerate their digital transformation. Now you would say, well, we remember the case tools of the early 2000s, or the application generators like Magic or Microsoft Access and even the 4GLs by the database providers like Informix or Oracle, and they're all gone by now. So why should we bother with this new trend of low-code, no-code? Well, Gartner predicts that by next year, most of the applications written by enterprises are going to be based on low-code, no-code platforms. And in fact, almost all big companies, Fortune 500 companies, are already embracing this technology for the past three to five years. So there's a lot of investment here. Uh, and quite frankly, there are a lot of circumstantial reasons why this time it is here to stay. But most organizations who adopt the local no-code practices also adopt the state of mind of, well, no code, no worries. Because, you know, what could possibly go wrong when you are allowing more people with no cybersecurity training the ability to generate more applications on top of sensitive enterprise data? Well, as security people, we know that we should be concerned. And the reasons are all these challenges, which start with the big numbers. We have many more applications created in a faster pace. By the way, I tried it. It takes 15 minutes to create an application from a path to deployment in production in any of these platforms, Power Apps or Mendix or OutSystems. It's amazing. 
So you have many more applications created by many more people across different parts of the organization. And they are not very skilled. And they are not security savvy. So what you end up with is that all the security practices, all the security tools that you've created for the standard software engineering processes cannot scale to this local no-code world or cannot adapt from a technical perspective to the new platforms. So you end up with no proper security coding practices, no proper security code testing, analysis, monitoring, and quite frankly, most security teams today do not have any visibility into what is actually happening in these platforms and to all these new applications being developed in our organizations. Which, of course, gives hackers an unfair advantage. Because, as you can see, the attack surface is growing fast and it's growing fast within the boundaries of OWASP Top 10. So the same SQL injection, authentication bypass, authorization bypass, insecure direct object reference, and whatnot. These are all the issues created by local and local vulnerabilities. So while enterprises struggle to import the practices they have into this domain, they struggle with finding tools to help them in the local and local domain, the attackers already have the knowledge and the tools in place to exploit the vulnerabilities. Because exploiting an SQL injection vulnerability, for example, in an application created using local no code requires the same exact tools as exploiting SQL injection with an application that was created using standard software engineering practices and standard programming languages. So clearly, Attackers are ahead of us in this race. And in order to take this theoretical discussion into something that is more practical, I chose a single type of attack, supply chain attacks. And, and by the way, supply chain attacks are part of the OWASP top 10 list for no-code, low-code applications. So why did I choose? specifically supply chain attacks. First and foremost, they are very easy to know and we all know the mantra and we, we keep chanting it for the last years, supply chain attacks, supply chain attacks. Uh, second is that all the platforms that we have today in this world of no-code, low-code have their own marketplace for third-party components, which is part of their uh, whole uh, business model because they are trying to promote community, they are trying to promote more users adopting this, uh, making it easier for them to get widgets, components, sample applications, and then build on top of that rather than start from scratch. Uh, so, so we can compare this issue across all the different platforms. Uh, we love to say in cybersecurity that the chain is as strong as its weakest link. And with supply chain attacks, the weakest link are the choices made by the developers. In this case, the citizen developers across the enterprise. And it's all about how soon the security team finds about these choices and how much can the security team control and compensate for these choices. So let's start with a simple example with a clear choice. And I'm showing you something that was taken and tested on UiPath. It's probably the leading platform for uh, process automation, a uh, very uh, powerful environment. And they have this development environment called the UiPath Studio, which you install on your desktops. Uh, and helps you visually create business processes and automate them. Uh, they have a nice marketplace for components. Uh, part of it is, is formal components by UiPath. Part of it uh, is for the general public to provide 
their components. And the choice I'm going to talk about is first the choice of a citizen developer to use a component that turns out to be malicious. Now, I'm saying the choice to use, but what I will show you in this short video is that the citizen developer is not even using the component downloaded from the marketplace in an automation or an application. That citizen developer only took a component from the marketplace, put it into their environment just to learn some more, just to get more sense of what they're doing. And as you could see, once that component is installed in the environment, there's a pop-up message saying you've been hacked. So the choice is the citizen developer's choice. The result is that we have a compromised machine within our corporate network from which an attacker can do lateral movement into different parts of the network. So that was a blunt choice to go after this type of component, which is malicious. Um, and by the way, we will talk about how do malicious components get to the marketplace. Now let's talk about a more subtle set of choices. And those choices are going to lead to a dependency confusion attack. Now, we know dependency confusion attacks as local attacks, mostly, and DLL replacement and so on. But we will show a remote dependency confusion attack. Now, the dependency confusion attacks that I'm going to talk about uh, is possible because most of the frameworks that allow you to use third-party components employ something that is called the package manager. Uh, this is the same, by the way, for uh, software that is developed using traditional software engineering practices. Now, package managers assist us with finding the right version of the package that we want to use in our program, in our application, in our automation. Um, usually what happens is that we have a number of sources or feeds configured with the package manager and they are all searched in runtime in order to find the correct version of the dependency of the component to be deployed into the runtime environment. And of course, if we are using a source that is public and not scrutinized for malicious content, then malicious code could be uploaded to that uh, source, to that repository. So let's look about some choices that can lead us to a successful attack by hackers. So the first choice, and again, I'm showing you an example from the UiPath Studio and local robot uh, runtime environment. First choice is about the sources. And it turns out that it is not much of a choice because by default, you have the nugget.org feed configured as one of the sources in the UiPath Studio. Okay, now that's a choice. A citizen developer could remove this public feed from the list of potential sources, but we're not talking about skilled developers who are educated to take care of secure coding and secure application building. We're talking about citizen developers all across the organization. So the probability that they will make the right choice here is very low. So we have this choice and it makes, it actually ends up with the package manager looking for packages in a public field. Now the second choice is about how do I reference the third party component in my application, in my automation. I can do that in a very strict way in which I say I want this exact version to be used in my uh, runtime deployment. But I can also use loose versioning requirements where I say I want at least this version, which means that if the exact same version does not exist 
in any of the available feeds, then the next version, the next higher version, would be taken instead. Again, that's a choice, okay? And you need to count on the citizen developer to make the choice. It's so confusing. So with these choices, we have an environment that is configured to scan public feeds, like the nugget.org, and then you have an application or an automation that is configured with loose versioning with respect to its dependencies. And then we have some of these dependencies, some of the third-party components for which the exact version is not found in any of the feeds. Now that could happen for a good reason. Consider, for example, if a version was found to be vulnerable with a critical vulnerability or it had a very serious functional flaw in it, then the developers of this component would probably put in a new version and remove the very faulty one. And in this scenario, an attacker could upload a fake package into the public feed with the same name as the component used by the citizen developer, the attacker would make sure that the uploaded component is marked with a version that is a little bit higher than the requested version and a little bit lower than any other version found in the different sources, in which case the package manager in runtime would retrieve the malicious package and use it to deploy in the runtime environment. Now that sounds a little bit complex and there are a lot of ifs and choices that needs to be made. So we went to check that in the wild and we looked at all the packages that are found in the UiPath official feed and in the UiPath marketplace. And what we found is first and foremost that almost all of these packages were created with loose dependencies. So by themselves, they were dependent on other components with loose versioning requirement. 20 of those packages were potentially vulnerable because the exact version mentioned in the project file did not exist in any of the feeds. Now, 16 of them could not be exploited because in the public feed, naga.org, the namespace for these packages was already taken, which is an important preventative measure. But four packages were vulnerable. So an attacker could actually upload to naga.org a fake version of any of those packages. And by this infecting any user who chose to use one of these components and compromise their environment. Again, we're talking about the UiPath Studio or the local runtime environment, which means now the attacker have a compromised machine within the corporate network with access to corporate data. So that was easy to show and understand in a runtime environment or a local environment run by a citizen developer. But it turns out that these dependency confusion attacks are not confined to local computers, but also affect the runtime environment in the cloud for the UiPath automations. Because the containers in the cloud are using the same package manager. And it turns out that, again, by default, they are too configured to use the public nugget.org feed. So again, we tried that. We created our own 
automation to be run in the cloud and we referenced a non-existent third-party component. It did not exist in any of the feeds. And of course, when you try to execute it, it failed because in runtime, the package manager could not find that third-party component. But once we've uploaded this component to the nugget.org feed and reran, executed the automation, it succeeded, which means that as an attacker, I could now have complete control over the enterprise runtime environment for automations with all the access to the external resources and the internal resources, such as the Salesforce accounts and the internal databases and whatnot. And this brings me to how do we manage to get a malicious package into the official marketplace itself. And the way we do it is by creating a non-malicious package and then playing confusion attack on ourselves. So here's how it looks. This is our very innocent package, which we created and we sent through the formal scrutiny and review process of UiPath. And it had the benign functionality. It had some mathematical functions that we care to implement, which can actually help citizen developers in implementing business processes in the organization. And you can see that someone is now using our component taken from the marketplace, putting it into a business process in the organization, and even executing it successfully, as we will see in a second. And as you can see, it all goes smoothly and has no side effects. Because at this point in time, everything is okay. Now, a couple of minutes later, and you do the same thing, and you'll see that the same component is now going to be used by either the same citizen developer or a different one in the same organization or a different one. And what you will see immediately is the same malicious side effect that we had earlier. So how did we do that? Very simple. We created a true component for UiPath. And the way we created it is we had a main component and it was depending on a third party component that we created. The main component we submitted for approval by UiPath. The, the dependent component we submitted directly to the nugget.org feed, which is a public feed. Now, the component went through review process and they were approved because they had decent functionality. Once that happened, because we were using loose versioning in our own component, in our own main component to reference the component in the nugget feed, once our component was approved, we uploaded to the nugget feed, the public feed, a new version of our dependency, which again was a little bit higher than what we, uh, a little bit lower than the version that existed already and a little bit higher than the one that we requested. So next time, everyone who used our main component deployed to runtime, the package manager went into the nugget feed and retrieved the new malicious version of our component. Mission accomplished. Now, at this point, you might think, well, UiPath, what are they thinking? 
what kind of company is this? And I'll tell you, it's a great company. You know, reason I have so many examples with UiPath is that I love working with UiPath. It's a very powerful platform. And, and we really do a lot with it. Uh, so we know it a lot and it's easier for us to give examples. But as you can see, none of what I've shown so far is a vulnerability of the platform per se. It's a set of choices by the developers who use the platform. Can this happen with other platforms? Yeah, sure. Let me prove that to you without systems and mandates. So here's my first trick with out systems. I can pull users out of my sleeve. Well, I can't, I have short sleeves today. But what we found out, and again, out systems, probably one of the two leaders in the local no code uh, arena for core business applications, for user facing applications, very powerful platform, have a very big marketplace for components called Forge. Now, we found out that if we manage to put a malicious component into that marketplace, that malicious component can create new enterprise users in the environment it's being used in. And once I do that, depending on some developer choices, I can actually get access to all enterprise applications. So let's take a look at the choices. First choice is to use our malicious component. That's an explicit choice by the citizen developer. Again, it's not even a choice to start using the component. It's a choice to explore the component because what we've done is we made sure that once the component is retrieved from the marketplace into the user environment, our malicious code starts running. And what our malicious code is doing, as I said earlier, is introduce new enterprise users into the out system environment. And here comes another choice which is an access control choice, again, by the citizen developers, okay? And it is a very common one because it's a choice that says access to enterprise application is provided to enterprise users. You can imagine why this would be the default choice for a citizen programmer, you know? For a citizen developer. There could be other choices made. For example, you could create for every application that you start in this environment a set of dedicated application specific roles and then you could grant to every enterprise user one of these specific application roles and then you could go and configure each individual module within your application to allow access to one of these application specific roles. You can clearly see why most citizen developers just choose to grant access to enterprise users. So once a citizen developer chose to use our component, all applications whose access control was chosen to look like this are now available for the attacker who created the malicious component together with all their data. And if that wasn't enough, it turns out that I can even pull administrator uses from my head. How do I do that? Again, with my malicious component, which again, I introduce into the Forge marketplace, I can add administrative users into the out system environment that is using my component. As you can see, I couldn't get access to the administrative interface of out system. 
Now, once someone, again, retrieved my malicious component from the marketplace, a new administrative user was created, and I can now get access to the administrative interface in the environment with all the access to enterprise data, with all the access to enterprise applications, everything. So the question is, how did I get my malicious application into the Forge marketplace? Didn't it go through a review process? Didn't they figure out that it's malicious code? Well, it turns out that this malicious code that creates enterprise users in the environment in which the component is used, it's not that malicious. This is an example of a real application that can be found in the Forge marketplace. It was actually posted there by out systems themselves as an example for an application that handles enterprise users. And it has the same functionality that I just called malicious a second ago. Well, I think I've made my case here. Um, and, you know, just to complete the set here, we have to talk about Mendix. Again, very powerful platform. Uh, one of the leading in low-code, no-code, again, core business applications, user-facing applications, customer-facing applications. They have their own market, they have their own scrutiny and review process for components that go into the marketplace. And we did the same thing all over again. This time we created a normal component with true functionality. We submitted it for the review process, and once it got accepted, it turns out that whatever changes I make to the component are immediately published to the marketplace even before review. So anyone who is going to be using my new version of the component is going to be affected by the new malicious code. <sighs> Turns out that we have a real security issue here. Um, so what do we do in order to mitigate it? Quite frankly, we're going to go back to the basics because we know what the basics are. We are implementing them for applications that are built through the standard software engineering processes. We know that in terms of the package manager, we need to ensure the correct configuration. We should use only trusted sources. We should make sure that we're using strict versioning rules. In terms of the component choice, we know that we need to look for the reputation and usage statistics of the components that we want to introduce into our organization. We need to vet those components. We need to check their exposure to dependency confusion attacks. We need to track changes in vulnerabilities to these components throughout the life cycle of the application or automation that is using them. And we need to apply threat intelligence in order to find out which components are already known to be malicious. So it's all very simple. But the reality is that it's easier said than done. Because shift left of security to traditional software engineering groups was difficult by itself. Imagine trying to repeat this process to a whole bunch of unskilled citizen developers dispersed all across the various business units of your organization with different cultures, different skills, different managers, and different interests. 
And what more is that they are doing everything faster. It takes 15 minutes from the moment you think of an application to the moment it's there running in production. So what can I say? The threats are imminent. The attackers are ready to exploit them. I've just shown you that with one example of an OAuth top 10 type of attack. I could probably do the same with the rest of the nine of them. So organizations must need to incorporate the security and governance tools and measures that we already know we should be using in their local no-code projects. And they cannot rely on manual processes and, and just, you know, manual threat management in order to do that. The numbers are just too big. They need proper tools for that. And the time is now. It took us 20 years to build proper application security practices and tools. I, I was there when it started. And it took us 20 years to incorporate them into our application development pipeline, the traditional one. Let's not wait 20 more years before we do the same for our low-code, no-code application development practices. Thank you. It was a pleasure and I love to take questions.